Hello. Uh, this is my talk. I welcome questions and comments, so feel free. Uh, go ahead. So, distributing secrets. Uh, my talk is a little bit about uh, a problem and a possible solution with distributing secrets in networks. So, what happened historically? Let's start from there, which is a simple thing. Historical secrets. We're using, yeah, I saw it, but what? <laughs> Usually, what happens is that distributing secrets just meant giving passwords to users. That was the simple world of all monolithic applications. Even over networks, you have just that one server, that one password. That was it. Very simple. There isn't much to distribute except for giving a, a password to users, but that wasn't the network problem. It was like interaction issue. Then containers came. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> but distributed system came. And distributed system and containers are like distributed system to the maximum. So let's see what happened. What happened is that now they're not just going to one single place, one single password is something. Now people are using directly or through devices like mobile phones, other services that use other services, that use other services, that talk to other things. And most of the th these things, they to somehow authenticate each other because they run on a network. And sometimes, maybe the errors within networks, you can kind of trust maybe within a single machine to have connections that are not authenticated or maybe even not encrypted. But in most cases, you cannot assume that you have to actually have credentials, maybe even certificates when you want to do TLS connections and all, I don't know, keys for S3 or whatever other cloud service you have, there are a bunch of things going on. Secrets everywhere in any distributed system. So, how do people tend to address this problem when they build a distributed system like a microservices with a bunch of containers running all, all over and services? They use uh, provisioning systems. Uh, it's nice big centralized systems with all the configurations and on the side all the passwords in the clear. Uh, all the admins that do anything in the distribution system have access to this data and they just get distributed willy-nilly to all the hosts and containers. Some people go to the great steps of baking secrets of the images and then publishing them and then find out, oh, all my IIOs and keys are there. Well, what happened? Why am I I can't go charge thousands of dollars, certainly. Uh, or maybe in uh, Git repositories, uh, which is also bad. Because if you remove the password you accidentally committed a Git repository, it's still there. Because it just passed it out, but the previous patch is still in the repository. So it's kind of a, an interesting uh, thing. And if you're doing that, yeah, you're doing something wrong. Uh, Call me your Richelieu. Give me four things you do, and I'll find five things you're doing wrong. But <laughs> security point of view. <laughs> so, we're all in the same boat, better. Uh, the main thing, I think, that people need to really realize, especially in infrastructure, is that secrets are not configuration. Sure, secrets are kind of configured in applications very often. But they are not configuration. Most of the case of configuration can always be public. Uh, there shouldn't be much in your configuration files that really compromises you critically if they're exposed, except for secrets, which are in the configuration. Uh, <coughs> so maybe there is a better way. Uh, and I don't know if you'll agree. Maybe you think there might be a little good thing for them. So let's try to define a little bit of problem space. And if anybody speaks it out, you know, watch the videos later. Uh, don't worry about the, the acronym. The acronym means it's not a bad word in here. Um, <coughs> so there are five things I, I kind of uh, uh, find out that are really interesting when you take the problem of how you distribute all these secrets you have around and you have to manage. Uh, and one are how to provide the secrets, update them, preserve them, protect them, and finally audit them. So in the next few slides, there are two statements about every 
uh, any of these problems. And one is uh, what happens in the traditional provisioning system is used to uh, distribute this information, and what happens if you were to use an API. Instead. So, providing secret, what does it mean? So you get a, a secret for an application and you need to private it. So you have a bunch of containers that need to access the remote file system. How do I give it credentials? Uh, well, the classic provisioning system will just have this usual password or key in a, in a config file which, which is uh, pushed to the machine. Uh, in uh, an API world, what happens is that if you can, you make the application actually pull the secret inside when you need it. Or you have a helper at least that pulls it when you start a container. You don't bake this secret in the provision system. Uh, update, what does it mean? Well, passwords may be compromised and I have to change them. You know, I might have to rotate them. So, in the traditional provisioning world, all you can do is to change the configuration at some point and then push out new configuration and probably restart the service in order to make it read this new uh, secret music. Uh, with an API, you can have uh, notifications and have application actually pull it when it's ready and without maybe even restarting the application itself, just start using a new secret. Uh, preserve. So this is, this is something that affects mostly uh, the container world, I would think. In the container world, you have images, but when you need to do updates, what you do is that you just wipe the image and then reload the new one. And you have the problem of data you have to preserve. Part of this data usually is password to access the service, because yes, you want to update the software, but you want to just keep connecting to that database. And so, again, uh, you need to have a way to either preserve these credentials in a way that when the container is started, they are still there, or you need to inject them. Uh, and you know, it's unclear what happens when the provision system is not involved, if you just start an image is already locked. Uh, again, in the API case, you just let the application pull their secrets, so you don't care uh, how you update it or how you preserve it. It's there. It's in the, uh, it's in the service that hands out the secrets, and the application just knows how to pull it. Uh, protect. So how do you limit access to the secrets? And one of the big issues I see at least in the, in the provisioning system is that you have this all this bunch of secrets for all these applications, and the provisioning system usually is managed by a specific group of people. That means this group of people have access to all the credentials for all the applications, even though they are not necessarily manage the application. Maybe they just provide a service to push configuration. Around. Uh, in an IPA world, uh, an IPA world instead, what you can do is that you can have uh, like access control. So you give specific secrets, maybe database secrets only to people that manage the database, or only to the application that have that specific database. These things are not all accessible at the same time, same place, by same people. You don't have to have people get it right. What if someone sends a wrong configuration to the wrong server? You don't have to worry that much about that case. And finally, audit. So, how do I know that the secret has not been compromised? In a provisional case where you provision stuff, where, you know, something that is used to push configurations, you have to audit, I don't know, everything. R-Sync, as an NFS, I mean, yeah, that's been possible, I think, to retrofit that uh, auditing in such a system so that you can track who has seeing this secret going on. In an API world, uh, much easier. You will have one service that has a password that knows what, uh, and knows what application is trying to pull it. And so you can track that much more easily because you have just two points, the place where they are stored and the place that's asking for the password. You don't have all the other infrastructure in the middle that's not preserved as secrets. But what about Wait. I've been talking about API, right? How do I authenticate an API if I don't have secrets? Well, here's where it's here why I'm talking all the time about applications, right? It is a great question, but I'm talking only about applications. You kind of have to trust the host, probably, but it's bare metal, at least. And host can be something that you want, and I want to define, but. In the cases that I've been looking at, uh, simplest one are where the VMs or containers involved. 
you have to trust the host. There's no way. The host has access to everything. It doesn't matter what happens. The host will have access to all the secrets within the VMs or within the containers. Just another, not the other way around. So you have to trust the host. What you have to do is that provision of the host is not solved the problem yet, but it's probably much easier to handle that where you assign a credential to the whole host. And then it doesn't matter how many applications run it, how many VMs run it. You have a, a, something you can trust there, and you can build on that trust to transfer everything else. Uh, so let's see an, an example of use cases that come up uh, that made me think of all this problem first and uh, why I came to the conclusion that an API is probably much better than a provisional provisioning system for this kind of problem. Uh, so we had the problem of trying to get free API running containers. Uh, at least just to try out if it could be made to work. And free API by itself, uh, if you don't know what it is, it's just an identity management system called is uh, like a centralized authentication system that has a ton of secrets in it and it allows you to authenticate all your clients. And one of the features of RPA is that it is distributed in the sense you can have multiple servers that all serve the same uh, kind of information and they have to replicate information with each other. So when you have to set up another copy to a lot balance to you know ge geographically distribute your service uh, we had a pretty manual system where you go on the on the existing existing server you know, run a command that generates a gpg encrypted file with all the necessary secrets to bootstrap a new server then you have to transfer this file to this new server physically be there or, or you know, sitting there, put in a couple of passwords to unpack the GPG file, get all these things out, and bootstrap this new image, this new server. Uh, uh, it works. It is relatively secure. Uh, it's, it doesn't scale in a dynamic environment. It's, it's, it's very hard to automate because you have to have very privileged access to both the machines, the one you have to install and one uh, like existing one, and it's a lot of steps you have to do, a lot of transfers. Uh, it can be kind of automated, but it's that's really always been uh, annoying to do so. Uh, plus, we were adding features uh, like this uh, so called sub CA feature, where we allow you to create multiple CA instances in the IPA, where you can do that on the fly and later on, once this is the whole system installed, distributed, I don't know, 10, 15, 20 servers. And when you create a new CA, you create a new certificate for that CA with a new private key, and you need to distribute that. So a number of secrets we have not only need to be distributed at the time you create a new clone of the system, but at times during normal function when you have to transfer them in a dynamic on the fly. And that doesn't work if you have to manually do it. So what you know, the admin creates a new CA and then goes and plugs in all the servers, grabs this key, bring it to another server, and uh, you probably will do something wrong at that point. <coughs> so we needed to have a, a way to fetch uh, credentials from the server, a secure method to transfer them, and a way to authorize access to these keys. These are the three main issues we have. So what do I need to be able to perform these actions? Uh, well, I need an API on the service to distribute it. I cannot do that manually. I really need a service to do that, an API that I can talk to. I need to be able to encrypt this information at rest and in transit. Um, I need, well, I don't technically need a REST API, but these days everything does it, yeah, right? And I need a, especially a modular design because while thinking about these things, uh, I kept, kept coming across other uh, similar problems in similar applications, not necessarily a free API, but uh, containerized applications that have this kind of problem. So I wanted something that was modular enough that it could be easy to extend and use and usable uh, in other situations. And well, thinking about things like OpenShift, for example, and other services that are not just even infrastructure, but go all the way to a user and have multi-tenancy issues. That was also the issue of being able to proxy around this data and, and you know, have dynamic 
access control. So I wanted something very modern. And so I decided to build a prototype, and this prototype was the uh, uh, meant to uh, create a basic uh, functionality for free API, so we could use it in there, but also explore the problems of this. Uh, uh, I wanted to build it as an HTTP server, mostly because the container Kubernetes Docker DevOps one is really involved with HTTP, and it's kind of the new IP transport of, of the inner world. Um, but I wanted it to be able to use a Linux socket because I want to be able to use it locally without exposing the service to that if I don't have to. Uh, next problem was how do I make sure that when I transfer secrets, I can do that securely. Uh, this it was specific, specifically important to free API for various reasons, and so I started looking at what I could use to encrypt data over the wire in a, in a way that wasn't kind of invented by me. And I implemented JW Crypto, which is another project that just implemented the whole standard now, and it got standardized while I was building it. And that's just a, a way to use JSON and a bunch of primitives to create tokens by either encrypt or sign or both any data type. So you can have any JSON structure and have it encrypted or signed based on keys you have and transmit it over the network. And also okay, easy steps there. So how does it work in principle? Um, it works as a kind of a pipeline. So you, the URI you pass in is basically uh, the address of the secret or credentials you want to access. Uh, it could be local, but it could be HTTPS, for example. So you have this client and goes and asks, uh, please server one, where well, the service is running, uh, give me the secret key bar. And it can also be it could be server immediately if you're talking to the server that actually has the secrets. Or maybe that server is a middleman that simply knows how, how and where to direct your requests and it just passes it on to the next server and it moves the URI and changes it and appends stuff or actually prepend stuff, whatever appends stuff. And that can go to another server. And what, uh, where that, that is useful is where you can have maybe part of the secrets uh, stored in one system and parts in another for various reasons. And so based on which secret you're asking, it could be redirected to different services. And you might end up translating that again into database query. Because uh, both requests and uh, well, but requests that come in and requests that go out by right, kind of pipeline, so you can transform that any way you want. And this is just an example to show how it, it, it might work. Um, so how do we transfer secrets in, in, in this uh, custodial project? I, I came up with two APIs, one is simple, in fact it's called simple, where you just go and contact uh, the service and ask for a secret by name. And if it has it, it gives it back to you. Uh, as you can see, I'm not showing any authentication here. Authentication can be completely plugged or whatever you want. There will probably be something in a header, C plus A is stupid basic pop, and you send a password there, it has problems. So it could be auth, could be just API protected, it could be anything. Or it could be just a local Unix socket, like I'm using, and then you just do uh, check what is the process on the other side, what is the SMB Linux label it has on. So authentication or and or authorization is kind of legion and also can be completely configured because uh, that is not a hard way to do any specific authentication authorization model. And to store a secret same, you just put and if you're allowed to put something in the namespace that you choose in this case, just then you get back to the one. Okay, you put your secret or an error. Uh, this is the very simple one. The simple one has one single problem. Everything is in the field. So it means you would probably want to have either local connection or TLS connection. This is not useful very much for me in the, in the IDK case, but this is the more complex one. Uh, it's still just the get, and you still have to provide the name of the secrets you want to reach, but then you have to provide 
something else. And that something else is a, a JWT, a JSON web token. Which is basically a sign that potentially encrypted, but in, in this case, I care only about the signing request. And it's split in three parts. Uh, the, the protocol requires you to base 64 encode things because you know, you're sending URIs to web servers, but uh, what these three pieces turn into are JSON blocks. Three separate JSON blocks. The first one is a header. The header uh, is not protected. Uh, it is protected, but Indeed, you have to be careful when you pass it because you will read it before you can verify it. And it contains the public key identifier. You know, so it contains an identifier of a public key that the other service needs to know. And that you use, you use a private key, of course, to sign the rest of the request. And it will also include an algorithm that you can choose. Uh, there are many algorithms that are available in the Jose standard. Uh, so you can choose one. And of course, on the other side, you can choose to accept that one. Then there are the claims. And this is completely arbitrary in the, in the JSON, uh, uh, the other standards. So this is something I came up with. Hopefully, it's not too stupid. Uh, one is this subject, which has to correspond to what you were asking. So you have to put in to the request the name of the secret. This way, I can as you sign that name without having to be on with the URI itself. And you have to validate that. Otherwise, someone could send a query for a name, have another one in, in the signature. Okay. An expiration time, you want to do that because you don't want to have someone be able to capture a request and then replay it later. Maybe after they were able to uh, decrypt your keys two years later or something. And then uh, an arbitrary value. Uh, the value is interesting only when you're trying to put the secret, when you're requesting a secret that is not there. And then you get the signature, and the signature signs the protected header and types. So you read this, find a key, make sure the algorithm is valid, check the signature, and then you trust what's in here. And then we get to the ceiling part. Then the service need to send you back the secret request. At this point, encryption is, is necessary because I don't know whether this thing is going up in the clear or not. You probably want to use TLS anyway around this, but you don't have to. And it is yet another uh, using web token, but in this case, it's using the this web encryption. It's more complex, has five parts. One is the header, similar to the previous one. Although, in addition to the signing algorithm, you also have to provide an encryption algorithm. Then there is uh, the actual encrypted key. Uh, the whole blob is not encrypted directly in whatever private, uh, public private key you have, but you create a temporary uh, symmetric key in there. And only that symmetric key is encrypted with your uh, public key, in this case. So the service will use your public key to encrypt something that you are you are, you are to the your private key. Um, initialization vector is needed by uh, the encryption algorithm you choose. So if you may S C D C you will have an ID, these other things you might not be usually use it. Uh, the ciphertext that is encrypted with the key encrypted in here, and an authentication tag to verify that the encryption was actually that, uh, so uh, it is authenticated encryption in this case. And that's it. So <coughs> that's for the problem of God. It's, it's two, basically, two uh, tokens, types, and that's it. Uh, now, authentication uh, is done by tokens and headers usually in the creative case of CIA in a different way. And here is how you prepare to uh, configure them. There's a configuration file that is going to see the service. And you can say authentication header. Header is the name of the module. It has handler, which is a Python module. Uh, potential configuration. In this case, this is one of the example um, uh, classes, which simply uses, uh, reads the header remote user and gives it to the stuff. 
So not something you want to use uh, directly on the network. It's more interesting where you have a proxy between you and Custodia that actually does some authentication and then sticks the remote user into the request. Um, there are a few of these modules available in the project. Uh, and then there's an example authorization where I can instead, out-z. Uh, this is taken from the RK project. Uh, and it has this handle. It, is, it, says, it says that anything under slash keys in the URI is protected by it. Anything that is not under slash keys, this thing does not apply. It tells you that the store can use IPA and it's not under uh, directly that defines the store that I'm showing here, and it tells you where the server keys are. And basically, this is used to use the uh, signing and encryption uh, tokens, and where the server can find its own keys to be able to back. So, how does it work within IPA in the end? Uh, you have one provision instead, and that provision instead is storing in the IPA server. Is a, has a data storage, the public key that you want to trust uh, for exchange of key material. Once the admin set the public key in LDAP, uh, the, the corresponding private key can make requests and accept and update any of the secrets in the in IPA server. And that public key has to be stored in a specific place in LDAP where only admins have access uh, of work. Um, then look, you can start. Uh, uh, creating a new server or replica or simply a, a replica that already installed needs to access to a new uh, key. It will send the request and sign to the token it showed before, use its own public key. What the study will do uh, is look up if that key is available in LDAP. If it is available, it will fetch also the encryption public key because it is a, a, actually a key pair in, in this case. Uh, Find out if the secret is available, rub it up, encrypt it in the encryption token, and send it back. And that's it. Uh, how do we do authentic uh, authentication authorization in this case is interesting. In the IPA case, um, any machine that's drawn in IPA already has a key token. So there is a basically a, a double authentication system here. One is, in order to, able to even talk to Custodia, you must have key tab, and you must have used uh, history the authentication against the web server, the Apache web server and the IPA installer. If you are authorized there, then the Apache web server proxies your request to the actual custodian email, which is listening only on the local server. The custodian will check that the service sending the request has the Apache UID, and has the SMS context of Apache. And it will check that the remote user uh, attribute set. Actually, I think it is GSS name because it is not up this again in this case. And that attribute contains the actual uh, principal name of the key tag that you used to authenticate. That principal name allows you to go in LDAP and search for uh, an entry that has that principal name in it and the two public keys. So it doesn't matter really that we send the public key in the signing token. We only allow uh, the user access to public keys that are associated with that principal. And then we double check that they are correct, of course, then we check the signature. But if there are the wrong keys, so if you get access to the key tag, but you don't get access to the signing keys, you still cannot access the, the, the service and vice versa. So you have to have both the key that and the encryption and signing keys to get access to this stuff. And that's all of it. Question? Sure. So if you have two containers that are pretty similar and you have something that on the host, which is custodial on the host, and you trust the host. How do you differentiate? Yeah. <coughs> so, let me kind of explain a little better with this image. So this one. Uh, so, <coughs> that's a good question. So, 
in this case, you can imagine that this one is a, is a local custodial server, and this one is actually a container. So this one will probably be related somehow, if you're using Kubernetes, for example, or Docker, will be related to that in the sense that when they spin a container, they will tell the custodial service, or maybe the custodial service will query, uh, what is the container ID? So when, and what is the socket this container can talk to? So when this container will contact locally on the Unix socket, the local custodial service, there will be no real authentication happening. Uh, because we ask the operating system, who is the UID on the other side? What is the socket that is communicating on? And then we can match that to a container. At that point, this one knows who is the container. And then you can use, for example, TLS certificate to connect to a centralized custodial service and ask for, give me this secret. And it will augment here either with the name of a container or more probably through a label that is associated with a container that the remote custodial service know about. So if you have, let's say, three applications around Kubernetes and, you know, a bunch of containers that do, I don't know, WordPress application, a bunch of containers that do uh, run a free API, and a bunch of containers that do something else, then when one of these containers can pack the local custodial service, they will get a label that is probably, I don't know, uh, WordPress. So when they will ask the next one, they will put WordPress here. Now, this other one will know that this, this custodial server can ask for WordPress secrets because it's one of the hosts that is allowed to run the WordPress containers. And then we'll trust this host that he's asking on behalf of one of the WordPress containers that will fulfill the request. If you have your setup set up, uh, your setup in, uh, in a way where you have only specific hosts doing, uh, doing stuff with uh, WordPress and only specific hosts doing stuff with free API, and the host uh, that deal with WordPress containers ask with free API level, the central system can say, oh, well, no. That host is not allowed to ask us about this information, no way. So basically, you have a, a chain of trust by which you can segment the partition your infrastructure and know to which you can give a specific signal. Now, of course, if you're running all the containers on all the hosts, then all your trust is just in the host, because the host can ask for everything. But that's up to you how to set up things. So, so are you thinking of a way of centrally controlling policy for that too? Because you have policy at two different levels, you're talking about a different systems. Right, so that's that something that is not built at all. Uh, so custodian is pretty flexible, so it, it's probably a 15 lines thing to build a simple uh, authorization piece. Uh, and with that, you can do whatever you want. You can protect an external system, full policies, or whatnot. My idea is that if we can work <coughs> something like this, with something like Kubernetes and Docker, uh, Kubernetes already uses ABCD to do stuff. And then you, so you would have a policy on it, and it will be already pushed to the host. So at least the host piece will get that policy as well, and probably get these labels in, and will already now have to label these containers. So this part is kind of simpler, because all you need to do is to associate the container with some sort of label, and then it only needs to know where to go next to ask. Uh, the central piece will be more complex. We will have to have some better understanding of who's allowed to do what, but again, uh, nothing impossible and uh, easy to manage in the sense that you can put everything in a few centralized places and you manage all the secrets there or you can say you know nobody can update secrets only admin from another host and all sorts of things uh, but that's that's probably the idea to have a, a policy system so in the kubernetes in docker kubernetes case you effectively expect that there will be an uh, instance of custodial serving a uh, no. tenant or a uh, pod? Well, again, that's actually the point of decision. So if you're doing your own infrastructure, you own it up to bottom, then you could just place a custodial server on the host and be done with it. Everything just alter it. 
But even in this case, <coughs> I'm, sorry, running, I'm, I'm sorry, that, that's a good point. So even in this case, if I have different applications running on top of that, how I can make sure that my SQL server uh, uh, and my, uh, I don't know, messaging server, they don't try to ask for the cigarettes that right. don't belong to. So as I said, if you have a lot of like Docker Maples or Docker, you will have a way to know, based on the socket, uh, who's asking for information. At the very least, you have the user ID of the process that is running, and probably an assembly label, although in the SPF case, uh, you have to be able to dynamically map them, because every time Docker runs uh, a new container, a SMU server has a new manage PCS label. But on the local system, it's easy to discriminate who's who, as long as you have that information provided by someone, or you have an API to request the information. That's, that's the only requirement you have. Or you set up your system in a rigid way, so you always get you know, specific ID, UID, specific MCS labels. You know, that, that's about to the point. Okay. Uh, I think it's more interesting in this case, maybe, where you have to actually, over the network, uh, decide who's who, but I would I would say that this case is more dynamic because of the local random container can be run, and this case is more about policy. So here you apply the label, and here you have a more rigid policy that associates a label with a tenant. And so if it's only our infrastructure, you're only dividing by application probably. If it is a more complex system like um, OpenShift Online, Mm -hmm. where you have actually two parts. You have <coughs> the infrastructure people, and you have a tenant, and the tenant may have multiple applications. In that case, you may have a three-layer approach, where you have a host system that's allowed to ask something to a container where the stuff is running, but that container is, is, is owned by the tenant, which decides its own policy. It's completely different from what the uh, infrastructure policy is for its own stuff. Uh, but the, the nice thing is that this is flexible and uh, can be handled by simply pipelining more stuff. So theoretically you have a group of containers that represent an application and each group of containers could have their own custodia server. They could. With each of them that would decide yeah. what they can do. Yeah, you probably, most probably have just one custodia service per tenant. Mm -hmm. Even if you have 10 applications, you just want one because it's, you don't want to have to manage 10 of them. Uh, so you will have access control lists within your custody service to know what the different home. So one of the modules I have called namespace makes it easy <coughs> to split the local uh, database where you have the secrets by namespace. So you have, a, I don't know, WordPress namespace, a database namespace, and mm -hmm. something else namespace. So then with these labels will trigger which namespace you're allowed to access. Uh, in your configuration file, you said you can have different um, authorization providers for different pads. Right. Do those stack? Like, could I have a default provider? They actually do slash stack. And then slash foo would be something else. Yeah, they can be stacked. There are some limitations there, um, especially with ordering. Especially what? Ordering okay. might be an issue if you want to do strange things. Uh, but the nice thing is that these are Python classes, so you could just if 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 you, have, if you cannot resolve something, you can always create a subclass and then do your own thing. And I did, I did that for IPA actually. So it's kind of flexible. Up to you how you want to configure it. You usually probably want to, if I think in, in the in the ADK, case, actually use two authorization plugins at the same time. One checks the UID and one checks the remote uh, name header. So I check both. And so I have two plugins. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so you can stack those. Okay. So if, if both pass your in, you either fails or out. Okay, cool. Yeah. Yep. Having written your own, <coughs> do you have an opinion on HashiCorp Vault product? Yeah, so uh, many people came to me <laughs> while I'm writing this thing. Oh, have you seen this cool Vault thing? And I think it's quite interesting as a project. The main difference is that Vault is not an API, Vault is an actual storage solution. It's true that they, use, they don't have to implement their own database, but it's not like you can proxy through Vault or anything. Basically, it's the final thing. So I, I see Custodia as something that uses Vault, 
in the back end. So maybe you know custodial store all this all this stuff in both. And basically front end both, exposing actually a simple API because for most users you don't actually care about the admin an admin API in this case. I mean applications just need to store in a retriever secret, but they don't have to give them access controls or anything like that. So I see for example anything that manages access controls or anything kind of stuff, sort of out of band, maybe not exposed to applications at all. And so yeah, vault there is a vault feature in IPA as well, where we can store secrets. Unfortunately the same name and they're coming out at the same time. But they both do the same thing. They actually do the final step of storing something somewhere, but they don't have any of the pipeline feature. Uh, Thank you. Yep. So you talked a little bit about Kubernetes. Have you looked into integrating it? I haven't worked into it uh, yet so because I think secrets API. Yeah, I haven't worked in worked on Kubernetes yet. I've been uh, finishing the integration of the API because we actually need this for a feature that comes coming out in the next version to actually promote a normal machine to a replica and to form a sub-CA feature, so I really needed to complete that and actually have, you know, demonstrate the API actually works for you. So now I'm almost done and I consider the basic IPA around solid because it's actually tested by me, it works to do the whole thing. And so then I can concentrate on trying to expand the use to random applications and find out what's missing there. So yeah, the plan is to look at uh, probably building a module in Go so they can be embedded whether in Docker, Kubernetes, or what you have. And yeah, work my way in there. Yeah, I don't plan to push you know, the Docker, Kubernetes, or what to use Python necessarily. But uh, that's what we have in IPA. Uh, the core is simple, so translating to something like Go would be, uh, should be rather easy. And will the plugins be reusable, or you would no. have to rewrite? Well, no, no. Because the plugins are just Python uh, classes, but the plugins are really. I think the most complex plug plugin is probably the code. So it's what was important for me is to create a structure that is pluggable, but not make the plugins necessarily complex. Hopefully, hopefully it works. <laughs> Other questions? No? Well, thanks. <laughs>